He sanded the woat, blew a little on the surface, and contemplated the winding path of darkness on the tawny wood of the keel. Definitely a crack, but the nature or nurture question remained. If the crack was at the surface level, he could fill it with epoxy and sand it. If the crack ran through the bore, that meant the wood was just bad wood, and he would have to rebuild the boat to replace the doomed piece. Richard Thomas looked back to the warm buttery glow of the house lights a hundred yards away as darkness began to infuse the air around him. Having put it off as long as he could, he started the trudge back to his joyless household. Once upon a time, things had been more promising. He married Karen Johnson, his high school sweetheart, shortly after college. She would not have even talked to a guy like him who came from a broken home, but she met him at a mixer at their church, which preached free markets and social justice. Be nice to the broken home kids, said her father, a psychologist. They're more like feral animals because life has abused them. Don't expect them to care about helping others, only me firsting. He scared her because his father was an all-company executive, and those were evil people, according to her parents, and she knew Richard as a blunt, outspoken guy who often left hurt feelings in his wake. He yourself, she said with typical teenager reverence. He saw a slender girl with an innocent face, unreadable gray eyes, and and bright auburn hair. She carried herself elegantly, like a dancer, and had some muscle from playing field hockey, and he knew she got high grades, but was quiet in class, as if waiting for some reason to step out of her shell. An inch short of his height, she seemed lively but unwilling to offer much of herself to the world, although he suspected that if she ever got confident enough to have her own opinion she would have much insight. They talked for the rest of the night, covering every random topic possible interwoven with the predictable getting to know you once. Karen went home that night in a state of sublime confusion. Like most of her generation, Karen had no idea what love was or its relationship to attraction and lust. She got one vision from the classic books they read at school, another from Hollywood and popular music, and still another from the church and her parents. In movies, the handsome man and beautiful woman met in some awkward situation, then started arguing in what her ad the psychologist called a codependent relationship, but eventually tumbled into bed together and in the morning, discovered they were in love. The books he was assigned in school praised the men and women who shrug off social pressures to remain virtuous then met their true love and companion in the midst of doing something selfless. Her parents emphasized finding a man with a good career who would not break up the family, but also refused to treat her unequally. She had never seen Richard as anything but one of the kids who she would leave behind with the rest of high school, but she felt something that might be a desire to make him like her, approve of her, even desire her. Karen and Richard ended up dating during the last year of high school, that bittersweet time when people know that imminent adulthood would split up old friendships and loves. She knew that Richard scared her too. Once in history class, the teacher noticed that most students were catatonic or asleep, and rounded on Richard with a question about Hitler and Stalin. Tyrants mistake what they are for who they could have been, said Richard. Stalin, a former bank robber, confused power with being important and turned his country into a bureaucratic dictatorship that killed 30 million of its people through sheer incompetence. Hitler, an artist, confused his popularity with being morally right, and started a war that devastated his country. A good leader rules for the sake of his people, not for the sake of his own power or self-image. The teacher wrinkled his brow, half of the class had perked up. But what about the war crimes, the genocides, and the oppression? Richard chuckled. History is written in blood, cruelty, and extermination because these are the only signals that wake people up. Otherwise, they just follow their own inertia. Hitler was like Robespierre, a true believer who ended up executing everyone who disagreed because he needed to believe his ideology was true. Stalin was more like Genghis Khan, a glorified criminal or third world warlord who knew his ideology was nonsense and was able to survive it as a result, mostly by sacrificing others. They're almost as bad as our current leaders, who are doing the same to us, just more slowly. Karen realized in that moment that there was something about Richard which she could not tame. She liked domesticated men like her father who followed the rules. When her mother had needs, he met them. And if he disagreed, he bit his lip and grudgingly carried it out. Her two parents were equals and discussed every decision together. Richard in comparison looked like some kind of feral animal which acted purely from his gut instinct and heart 
and she knew this could not be controlled. But she also knew in her gut that he was the only man she could ever truly love. You need to date other bows, said her mother, Beverly. You can't go through your life having bonded with only one man. That will always be an unequal relationship with him having the upper hand. He needs to know that there are absolute rules that he cannot break. A marriage is just like a small social group where unless you stake out power for yourself, you will be forced to conform to what others want. And so Karen found herself putting her name out there and dating other boys. She never got further than heavy petting and oral sex, having learned early on the best way to end a date without getting naked. This made her moderately more popular, and she finished high school on a high note. If Richard noticed her skills improving, he never questioned why or at least never said anything. Richard got a full scholarship to the same local university she was attending, but Karen's mother decided to experience a wider range of sexual partners. No one was fooled by her working late or girls' night out. The marriage disintegrated like a sparrow hit by a space shuttle, scattering Karen and her brothers to two different apartments on either end of the city with varying degrees of not enough money. Finally, she understood what Richard had endured, except that since his father was an executive for one of the big oil companies, they had possessed more money and her parents, a school psychologist and middle school history teacher. She escaped the genteel middle class poverty and disorder of her home life into marriage with Richard. He got his first major job and the children started coming. Daniel, when Richard was still at entry level, and Kaya, Robert, and Suzanne, after each time he got promoted. Soon they had a nice house in a decent suburb. Are you content? Richard asked Karen one night. I think so, she said. I'm not sure that's the question. Are you happy? Happy, he said. I don't believe in it. He read to her from the book he was reading, an old favorite of his that she never really liked. You're a rotten driver, I protested. Either you ought to be more careful, or you oughtn't to drive at all. I am careful. No, you're not. Well, other people are, she said lightly. What's that got to do with it? They'll keep out of my way, she insisted. It takes two to make an accident. Suppose you met somebody just as careless as yourself. I hope I never will, she answered. I hate careless people. That's why I like you. We are each responsible for our own happiness, said Richard. It's about being responsible to your own true self. You have to make yourself good so that you can like yourself. And only then can you appreciate what life is really about. She looked at this man as if she barely knew him. Seems joyless. Not at all. Just a realistic outlook, said Richard, lighting his pipe. What you are, your job and how others see you, is not who you are. You choose to become who you are. Even love is a choice. As Siddhartha would say, external events are neither happy nor sad, but thinking makes it so. Time moved on and they both forgot that conversation as it slipped into history. By her mid-thirties, Karen presided over a brood that was starting to be mature enough to look out for itself. As parents find out, by the time the kids hit puberty, your window of opportunity to teach them much of anything has passed. They are then launching into adulthood, even if just the early stages, and make decisions for themselves based in part on whatever they learned from their parents to the degree that they trust their parents to teach. Richard had made the transition from having a job where he showed up and did what others told him he should, to being a business owner, which meant spending most of his waking moments thinking about how to maneuver his company into position where there would be enough money to acquire a stable market niche where it could expand. He now had three employees, two negotiators and an office manager. His office manager, Sue Scott, came to him straight out of graduate school. She had gotten her MFA in creative writing, only to find that the insular little community which approved the next big thing in literature had clear tastes and she, who liked both the classics and ancient texts, her undergraduate degree was in classics, for their eternal themes, was not going to make it in a world of the latest ironic styles and personality quirks. What do you hope to accomplish here, said Richard, without looking up. Sue looked up at him with bright gray-blue eyes. Mr. Thomas, I like to speak plainly, she said. After a few moments, I need a job that I won't hate. My degree is somewhat worthless, so I'm starting over, and I want to learn the practical skill of running a business so someday I can start a cat rescue and not have it go bankrupt like most of them do within a few years. I'm here because of all the places I called. The people here seemed real and everyone has been honest with me. 
Richard thought. You're hired, he said. What? She colored and then withdrew her eyes. No, it's not for your appearance. We are professionals here and we don't do that because it would damage another human being. I'll warn you, I'm not a sensitive man, I'm a caveman, but I like fair play. No, you took a big risk with that answer, said the plain truth, and seem highly competent based on your undergraduate work can part-time jobs, so I'm going to bet on you. Although she had a rocky start, having to learn what was basically new language for business, she picked up the business quickly once she got her footing. Richard had not been attracted to her at first, although she was an attractive girl next door with a slender graceful face and light body, but once he came to rely on her daily he saw her as intelligent and diligent. However, he was committed to his marriage, his business, and his concept of fair play, which meant that he wouldn't cross that line, especially for someone a few years younger than himself and financially vulnerable. What? She said to him one day. I'm sorry, he said. You were looking at me like you wanted to say something, she said, apparently oblivious to the deep smoky gaze from her boss that he had momentarily forgotten to hide. Ah, uh, just thinking over this client meeting, he temporized, it turned out to be fortunate, because later that week she showed up with her beaufriend Alex, he was a dancer, muscular like a boa constrictor, and agile enough to balance on one foot on the rail above their two-story conference room. Richard went home and took a cold shower, realizing for the first time the pain of temptation and the satisfaction of turning it down, he had been tested and had prevailed. Life went on, and soon he was lost again in building up his company, the first attempt at renovating the old sailboat his grandfather left him, and taking care of the kids. He quickly forgot about Sue except as a colleague and was thankful for it. With more free time on her hands, Karen took a job at the advertising firm where her uncle worked. The offspring were already busy like adults, sports, rock bands, art classes, ballet, debate, and martial arts after school, then on their phones or doing homework until midnight. She started as an administrative assistant. During her second week there, the manager above her quit, and before Karen knew it, she had stepped into the role that required that she spend at least 10 hours a day at the office. But by getting up early she could make it and her husband, who got home early, could make dinner for the kids. She shared her fears with her mother, Beverly. I feel like I'm shifting into two people. One is at home, where there is no glory, just more socks to wash. The other is my career, where I am rising rapidly, and now I wish I could move into the city. Yes, but who's going to remember him when he dies? Said her mother, he's another blank face in a suit and tie. You on the other hand, are breaking boundaries with a job that is both progressive and soon, immensely profitable. Your life is made significant by what you are and what you are doing. Deverly was still working the same job at the school district where she met the man who she intended to become her second husband. It turned out however that his wife was willing to forgive his transgressions, so he went back to her and never ran away with Bev as they had planned. She ended up living alone, but enjoying a vigorous social life and was featured in several local magazines for her work in bringing Christian compassion to the underprivileged. When Karen dropped off a casserole to her father, who lived in the apartment he could afford, after alimony and child support, he expressed weariness. Don't let a job ever become your soul. They're not worth it. You're who you are with the job, or without it, and the family is just the bonus. You'll always be my smart, loving, kind little girl. Take it from me. I gave too many years to the job, church, and politics. I wish I'd spent that time making more connections with people. If you want to be famous, write a book or something. Now Karen wandered in doubt within the catacombs of her mind. She had never been one of those kids that everyone knew and talked about, just a wallflower, albeit a top-scoring and highly respected one. While Richard provided a good income and was a loving father, he was not like the men she read about in the news who were inventing new social media, making rocket ships, or running non-profits that made microloans to starving people in the third world. Karen found herself promoted again, as the company fragmented in response to a potential merger. Half of the staff left out of disgust at being absorbed by its competition, but to Karen, the move was brilliant because it more than doubled their market share. She took over the positions vacated by the defectors. When she presented her ideas to her boss, Yep Sheehan, 
he visibly brightened at the potential benefit of her new marketing direction that united sound capitalist wisdom with human rights activism and insisted that she work with him directly. Soon she found herself spending more time at the office. Her family, like all organic things, adapted. Daniel did more of the cooking, as did Richard. The younger ones helped with washing vegetables and cleaning the house. They were all proud of her, she thought although she sensed some hesitation from her spouse. During this time, she got closer to Yep, and they ended up having a close working relationship as they reorganized the bloated company into a tough fighting Kareeming for market dominance. Her friends barely recognized her. Karen had updated her wardrobe and spent an hour every morning in her home elliptical gym. She knew she looked like a million bucks because heads turned when she came into a room. The former wallflower of her high school days had not only broken the glass ceiling and crushed tinny quality, but had become desired for her mind, body, and personality. Her family receded to the status of a line in her biography. Richard observed this from a distance, having seen it many times in his day job. After all, his mother had left to be an executive vice president in Bangkok but he never told Karen that. What was first a nagging in his gut became a heaviness, then an emptiness, and finally a contortion. He began to notice he was short of breath sometimes, like he had forgotten to breathe, and that he frequently felt the cramp in his gut. You know, Richard said, one day, and they were cutting up green beans for Saturday dinner, I always try to apply the wife test at work. If I'm doing something, and you were to walk in and be upset by what I was doing, I wouldn't want to do it. That even includes being behind closed doors alone with a female colleague. Oh honey, I wouldn't care, said Karen absent-mindedly, and Richard saw in that moment how her outlook had changed. There was no jealousy, which meant that she longer cared enough for him to possess him and exclude all others. For love to exist, Richard knew, it had to be jealous, otherwise it was merely using another person for convenience. It's a good rule, he said, I mean, if you want to keep your spouse happy, are you happy, Karen? Karen said nothing. They fed the kids, watched a terrible action film that delighted everyone with its crude action, and then retired to bed. Richard spooned around Karen and tried to engage her, but she pulled away. Not now, she said with the same voice she would use with a subordinate. She turned over and by the little book light, began going through a binder of documents related to the upcoming merger at her company. Richard slipped into an uneasy sleep. He knew from science class that when a female rejected the sperm of a male, it meant that she regarded another male as having higher status and would never go back to the old one unless her gambit failed. Having grown up on the idea that love meant forsaking all others instead of constantly being on the lookout for a new opportunity, he found her response troubling. He faded into an uneasy sleep in which dark thoughts and images jarred him. When Karen got up, he was nowhere to be found but soon he came running up the driveway. Over the next few weeks, Richard worked up to running five miles a day, worked out in their home gym in the garage, and upgraded his old slouchy wardrobe. That Saturday night, a sitter appeared, and he took Karen to her favorite Italian restaurant, a movie, and a sleek new outsider club for drinks and dancing. She danced with him twice, then checked her phone and said they should go home. He feared what he had seen many times before, People mistook the signal for the action, the map for the territory, the appearance for the reality, the gesture for the meaning, and what they were for who they were. The grass was always greener, he thought, because you knew the disadvantages of your present situation but only saw the advantages of changing to another. In the new grass, things started well, in his experience, but then ended catastrophically. He redoubled his advances, he showed up at her job with flowers, and observed her secretary rolling her eyes. He wondered what she had been told about him. He called her twice a day, without fail, and repeated his Saturday night moves. He had lost five pounds, so he increased his workouts, and soon could see muscle definition improve. In a Hail Mary pass, he bought her a necklace that she had commented on in the window of one of the jewelry shops. He felt the mistake coming like a distant storm but was powerless to stop it. In each case, she expressed gratitude, stayed around for the minimum amount of time required to be polite, and then excused herself to do some work in preparation for the next workday. You've been rather distant lately, he told her one night. What can I do to keep our marriage afloat? He looked at her with vacant eyes. He knew that there were two options here. She admitted the problem, 
they worked on it, and life moved forward because they were in unison. This meant that she still had faith in him, respected him, and was on his team, working for the good of their mutual interest. She denied the problem because she either did not think it could be solved or had no interest in doing so. This meant that she had, in her heart and mind, already left the marriage and saw it as something of no consequence. What do you mean? Karen temporized. We don't go out anymore. We barely make love, and when we do, it's like you're waiting for a cab, we rarely talk. I haven't seen you smile at me without being prompted, or spend any time with me unless I demand it, since you took this job, said Richard. He knew where this was going, and to his surprise, it did not make him mad at all, it made him sick, ill, and restless. He saw everything that he wanted slipping away, like a candle melting and pouring down a drain. Karen looked right at him. To him, this was a crisis. To her, this was a delicate situation that she had to defer, like putting off a supplier who wanted to be paid at her job. In her mind, she would eventually come back to the marriage that she now believed she had settled for. Right now, she had bigger opportunities, and the marriage was her backup plan for when she was done enjoying all that life could offer her. I haven't noticed a problem, she said lightly. They went to bed that night in separate worlds. They might as well have been in isolated dimensions, on distant planets, or different species for all they had in common now. Richard wondered where he went wrong, then realized that Karen had always had a crusade in her life, with the downtrodden opposing the powerful. By being a good husband and provider, he became the powerful entity against which she rebelled and took delight in defeating. He talked to his longtime friend, Sheriff Danville Harris, who had advised his father during the times of divorce. She's dancing with the devil, the sheriff said. I never really took up with religion, other than generally believing that some benevolent force created this place and takes care of us, since we're basically suicidal morons most of the time. He chuckled. I always thought the Old Testament God must have had a giant bottle of Advil, watching his people go out there and do nothing but screw up nonstop because their egos got in the way. At the police academy, they taught us a little about Jung and Froe and the ego and it basically goes like this. The sheriff lit up one of the Italian cigars he favored, having cut it in half through the bulge in the middle with his pocket knife. The it makes the decisions, it's basically who we are in our guts and souls. The ego explains what happens in response to our decisions in such a way that we look good to ourselves and others, which is what we think of as what we are. The it is basically a lot of conflicting impulses and the one that is least disruptive and most advantageous, at least in theory, wins out. He smoked and continued, at the academy they told us to explain things to the egos so that the it selects the path of least resistance. Make fight or flight impossible, offer some food, and you can get them into the system without violence, most times. Your wife is doing things backward. Her ego is making the decisions, forcing the it to go along, which is why she's losing a sense of who she is. I guess the question to you, the sheriff said, puffing lightly to reignite his flagging cigar as he spoke, is whether you want to fix this. After, she has, as the saying goes, showed you her ass, this is not just a surface blemish, but something that's gone wrong with her deep inside. Life is nothing but staircases. When you're going where you need to be going, it's a tough trudge up. When you are going someplace bad, it's a hop and skip down. She got on a down staircase somewhere and can't find the up one. Do you think she cheated on you? No, said Richard, not physically, yet. But in her mind, she is ready. And now that I know that, I can never enjoy her again. My faith in her is shattered, and so is my respect following her own rejection of me. She just threw away my love, trust, affection, and hope. That is surely true, the sheriff said. When you choose another man, you have told the first one that he isn't good enough for you, and that leads to just two paths. Either you take him back but resent him, or you reject him so that you do not resent yourself for having settled. Once they make up their mind, in my experience, they may not be right out the door quite yet, but they're heading there. Yep, said Richard darkly. Well, thanks, Sheriff. I'll figure something out. When he next saw Karen, on a night when she was not working late, he gently suggested that they spend more time together to keep the marriage healthy. Then he tried to invite her out to ballroom dancing lessons, but she begged off using her workload as an excuse. He invested hours in foot rubs, conversation, and a better grade of wine. No dice, 
In each case he felt her scorn, realized how little he was in her eyes, and sensed the weight in his gut gaining another few tons of dark hopelessness and gray misery. Finally he simply asked, Do you want a divorce? Said Richard dot dot. What? Said Karen. Why do you ask that? I'd like an answer first, yes or no. Karen turned back to her reading. No. I don't think so, why? Well, it wouldn't be prudent, would it? We have kids, we have a house, we both have careers, where we benefit from having spouses, and, and, said Richard slowly, drawing out the syllable. And, oh, I love you, said Karen. Her eyes now turned toward the floor. We're going to grow old together, we'll have grandkids. We can get that house on the lake that we always talked about, and spend our golden years there. Richard looked at her, his eyes clear, she could not see the tragedy there. Back when they loved each other, she would have told him he was a big silly idiot and smothered him in kisses. Now, she treated him like one of her subordinates at work, or maybe an intractable supplier, and had basically admonished him into silence. What about meeting him halfway, supporting him, and making him feel the love? Nope, that was as dead as their sex life. Robert, age 14, gave him the next piece of the puzzle, since all of life is mystery, and the first stage in solving a mystery is to identify all of the pieces in play. You know that girl I was going to go to the fall dance with. She bailed on me to go on a camping trip with Owen Rogers and his weird family. The one you gave the necklace to, asked Richard. Yet, yeah, just a week ago, said Robert. Oh well, you know, Alpha Kooks and Beta Box. Girls want a stable guy to provide the cash and a stud for the sex. He blushed slightly at the language. You're a nerd, but also a stout, said Richard, tousling his hair. It's going to take a few years to show though, but some girl is going to see you're a catch someday. Want to hit the gym with me? We can bulk you up a bit. Yeah, said Robert, that'd be great. I saw that you've been building up some muscle too. For miles away, a frustratingly close distance separated by the social convention that men do not just show up at their wives' place of employment, Yep was having a similar conversation with Karen. He's a good guy, a good solid husband, said Yet, but you and me here, we're doing something big. This is going to be the first at firm in history to merge good deeds and big profits. He's a good guy, a good solid husband, said Yet, but you and me here, we're doing something big. This is going to be the first at firm in history to merge good deeds and big profits. We'll go down in history, so I need you, all in, if you know what I mean. Karen looked up, her eyes focusing dryly. They both knew what he was saying. Back at the house, Richard had fed the kids, read to Suzanne, helped Kaya with geometry, and called Daniel, who was at the State University on full scholarship. He resolved to stop spending time on his wife and to instead enjoy his children more. When Karen got home and went straight into the shower, taking her phone with her, he flinched in the bed. His gut began its torturous twisting and a cold sweat broke out above his eyes. Little sleep came his way that night, although Karen snored gently like a purring cat. When he looked in the mirror in the morning, he saw the dead level set of his eyes and the lack of glow in there, their normal bright blue reduced to a dimensionless cobalt. He did not recognize the expression first, but then remembered it from his high school project volunteering at the VA, where he met men who had seen too much of war. These were the eyes of someone trying to hold in his agony, uncertain if at any moment the devil might spill from inside and leave a ravaged bloody wasteland in his path. Is everything okay? Sue asked him halfway through the morning. They were struggling with a new contract that was going to cramp their schedules and possibly be a money loser. Oh, not much sleep, he said, that's all. I'll get another coffee and get it together. She looked at him with concern. I'll get the coffee. Don't get used to this. He ended up smiling despite himself, and by the end of the day he had pushed everything into place, renegotiated for additional fees, and come up with a six-month schedule that he could bend around existing clients. He said his goodbyes and began the drive home, letting his mind unfocus and relax as he had learned long ago in his Vipassana training. Then it hit him onto levels. A marriage was a love partnership, a family, and a business. He needed to address his problem in a business-like manner, and then use business logic to fix it. Over the past few days he had done some research on cheating spouses. Most of them, it seems, were simply bored and felt insignificant. 
It usually happened at the job, which was a substitute for the sense of well-being conferred by family. When self-pity and lust coincided, the urge became strong. Most affairs went unnoticed, although in his experience that usually meant the marriage was a zombie, a once-living thing now dead but reanimated without a soul. Very few lasted long, although once someone had cheated once, they were more likely to do it again, he noticed. He also listened to stories on YouTube which told of such tragedies, he found them unbelievable. He could not imagine wanting to harm his wife, nor having rage, he had pain instead. A deep ache resonated through his body, pulsing through his eyes and fingertips with every breath. It was just that, a tragedy, an insoluble tragedy. He found the reconciliation stories to be also unrealistic and over-emotional. What had been was broken and could not be repaired, Daddy. Kaya greeted him at the door. He looked up and saw the three sets of eyes of his children watching him carefully. They knew. He realized. They always do. He thought, recalling how he had felt an inner pain and rolled gut when his mother came home late, and when he looked up and caught his father's eyes, seeing that same dullness and inflexibility there. People in pain see life in terms of reduced options, he realized, so his first step was not to do that. His second was to care for his kids. When Karen came home late, she entered a spotless house. Two large pizza boxes were in the recycling bin, the homework was done, and the kids were in bed. She couldn't find her husband, at least until she looked out at the backyard. There he was, by the light of a Coleman lantern, sanding down that old boat. She turned on the kitchen light, knowing she would be backlit in the floor to ceiling windows. He looked up, but did not wave, she went to bed. Friday morning, he came padding up the walk, sweat drenched from his run. Karen was just preparing to leave. Ow. Richard, she said, as if the impulse suddenly hit her, he felt the air ionize between them. I forgot to tell you, I'm off on a business trip this weekend, she said. He nodded. There was no point telling her not to do it. She had already done it in her intellect and her heart. He knew from his reading that the actual act of cheating occurred the instant the cheater psychologically downgraded their spouse to the level of being someone who needed to be deceived, manipulated, and misdirected. Almost all of them saw it as somehow their due or a compensation for past wounds, and so they did not simply use their spouses. On some level, they hated them, even if they could not admit it. Richard believed society had to levels corresponding to ego and it. The it consisted of its suppressed desires left over from nature, but the ego was how it explained them to itself as something good instead of bad. When he heard someone say, we are all equal, his mind translated it into me first. When they talked about patriotism or free markets, it meant and others serve me. When they spoke of the sanctity of marriage, they meant neutering the man with rules that made him serve the woman. He had thought Karen was different. He had loved the shy, sensitive, and insightful girl he first met at that church mixer since their first date. He did not mention it to her for some time, sticking to the code of fair play that he and his father share, since he didn't want to put her on the spot or make her feel manipulated. He wondered if he had always been wrong, or if something had finally caught up with her and driven her over the edge. Is there anything I should know? He asked gently. No. Richard, nothing, she said. Looking annoyed then got in her car and drove off. Nothing. That was the sensation that dropped over his soul, an eternal and infinite emptiness, where nothing mattered except the sensation of the moment. He wanted to become one with the emptiness, to clear his mind of everything, and exist only in that crystalline structure of logic where every detail got filed in the right place, forming lattice of knowledge, each level dependent on the one below. He wanted to separate himself from emotion, sensation, desire, and most of all, awareness of who he was and the situation he was in. Daddy, Suzanne asked, looking into his eyes. Richard came back to consciousness, work was over and he had made it through somehow, and now he was home with his children. The clarity of his inner world, made it to the wider world beyond his immediate concerns, had been a great refuge. The emotions came back to him quickly, trepidation, a sense of observing a travesty from afar, and a sodden, blood-scented sensation of deep loss. This too will pass, he reminded himself, and he turned toward his daughter. Are you okay? She asked in her thin, wavering child's voice. Now that you're here, I'm great, said Richard. He had gone to work, he had done well, he had been brilliant, inspired even. 
He had given all of his nervous energy and growing sense of despair into the job, and results had been good. Now he had to take care of his little people, having had an hour or so after work to clear his mind. Then he looked at his watch. It had been three hours, and I'm late for dinner, he said. It's pizza time again, kids. Cheers resounded, and they settled down for a few rounds of some hopelessly violent video game for the boys while Kayo, Ed, and Suzanne watched again an animated movie about a duck that saved the world with a chainsaw. Or something like that. Richard was a bit distracted. The local pizza guy was getting to know them well, mainly because Richard tipped well in exchange for an absence of small talk, and after a riotous pizza party, he got everyone into bed. Homework would wait until Sunday afternoon. The next morning they took a trip to the zoo. Robert, a bit old for it, waited through politely and lingered in the reptile house. Kaya was enraptured by the birds, and they circled the outdoor cages three times at least. Suzanne did her best to see all the lions, tigers, bears, and otters, her favorite, but then became fidgety and after being placated with cotton candy, wrote her sugar high straight into a deep sleep in his arms, sending her father's shoulder also into deep sleep. Then it was time for backyard games, tossing around an old foam rubber football and horse playing, until the twilight settled on the land like a warm blanket. Richard dug back into college memory and whipped up a dinner of organic hot dogs, bell peppers, spaghetti, cilantro, and pasta sauce with some sour cream whipped in to make it Alfredo-ish. Then they raid or played video games around the fire he set up in the pit in the backyard, while Richard resumed sanding his boat. He looked out over the lawn backyard, stretching down to the water of the fourth-rate canal on which they lived. In a city permeated by waterways, he could see the value in having won the fancy homes in the big-name subdivisions on the lake, but he knew that everything came at a cost. Here they could have a normal life, no other normal people, and be both aware of their own unique abilities and simultaneously humble in enjoying others and their own contributions. He knew that everything he was doing, he did for the kids, and if it killed him, he would not have them live the life he had lived. Richard never saw himself as a victim, he saw challenges thrown in his way, and would go into his meditative state, something he learned, oddly enough, from his Methodist pastor growing up and figure out what was actually going on. How did the situation work? Once he understood the structure, the mechanism, and process formed of the relationships between action and consequence at every level, he could work around it or make it work for him. He sighed, feeling mature and possibly older than he had been that morning. College Richard, a bow with a shock of hair, larger muscles, and a zest for life, would have looked at this sedate existence and laughed then crushed a few more Milwaukee's best cans and gone off to raise some hell. Or maybe not. Somewhere, Richard knew that he had always wanted this. He distrusted greatness and preferred an ordinary life, one in which his mind was clear, so that if he did find opportunity for some kind of great invention or moment of history, he could seize the day without mental confusion. Sunday, they went to church. Richard knew from his gut that he believed in God, even if he distrusted any book written by a human because he understood cause-effect relationships. The sky is dark at night, however, a dark sky could also come from weather, a solar eclipse, or even the final battle at Harmageddon between the forces of order and fire. However, if the world was go as a whole, only one thing could cause that, and in the recesses, this heart richer had long ago found God and loved him, even if he hated organized religion as much as he detested politics and social media. He did not call his wife, Monday dawned bright and early and he got the kids in the car to go to the local Korean Montessori school, which was less Montessori and more of a classical education with a modern flexibility. When he went to school, the teacher's lounge smelled like coffee and cigarettes. Here, it smelled of yerba mate and wheat, but like most realistic men, Richard did not buy into categories much. Some hippies were good, just like some all-company executives were decent, honorable men. It was a complex world out there, more difficult even than emotion. Dashing off to work, Richard made friendly small talk, then hammered away on his keyboard, phone, and file cabinet for a good 10 hours before turning home. Sue gave him a few weary looks, but he returned a slightly absent smile, conveying an enjoyment of what he did coupled with determination. When you are the boss, you have to leave for the good of your people, and if you have to deceive them, it must, with no exceptions, be in their own interest, even if they don't know it, he thought. 
Speaking of tyrants, his wife breezed in the door late once dinner was already on the table and announced that she had eaten, then fled for the shower. The kids exchanged knowing glances, Richard looked at his children, a cross between his wisdom and his wife's raw intellect and passion, and knew that they would not be fooled. Look, guys, he said suddenly, choking up a bit. You know I love you, right? They nodded, bright wet eyes looking up at him. I'm always going to be here for you, and mommy too, said Richard. If you trust me, worrying about nothing, we're going to get through this. Surprisingly, this worked. Children, creatures of an age of innocence that peeled away almost invisibly like onion skin, trusted the firm word of an adult who seemed to have a plan. He got them situated with homework, helped with some algebra that he had not known he remembered, and then put on his old beater fishing hat and headed down to the boat. He wanted to look at that keel again, and saw with new eyes how the crack might well be something the original builders did not see, maybe a knot in the wood or some deep rot. He made a mental note to buy a replacement, then began dismantling the boat. Maybe he could all and sand the replacement wood a bit further, making the seals tighter. As he headed toward the trash cans with an armload of dead wood, he heard Karen on the phone. She was looking into the living room, oblivious to his presence, so he stopped to rearrange the heap of wood scrap he carried. When I came back in the morning, she said, twisting around slightly to reposition the phone under her eye. I, she said, and stopped. He looked up and saw her eyes in the mirror on the wall leading to the living room. She looked right into his eyes. I, I mean evening, she continued loudly walking into the next room and leaving behind whatever she had been tidying up in the kitchen. At that moment, it began. Richard leaned forward, with scattering around him, and projectile vomited onto the small concrete plateau on which the trash cans lived. He heaved once, twice, three times, spattering a batter of half-digested food, a soda pop he had unwisely had at work, and stomach fluid so acidic he could hear it hiss and crackle as it spread on the concrete. With nothing in his stomach, he wiped his mouth, then got the hose and sprayed down the concrete, gathering the rotted wood. Now faintly reeking of phosphoric and hydrochloric acids, he tossed it into the trash, then let the lid fall limply. Before that point, he had suspicions, now he knew in his gut, but had no proof. He was not even sure that he wanted it, or it mattered, but the part of him that rigidly stuck to fair play insisted dot dot. He mulled over those thoughts as he climbed the stairs. As soon as he entered the master bedroom, however, he was running for the toilet, tossing out even more of the contents of his digestive tract. The retching contorted him so much that tears flung out of his eyes and he fell to the ground. Oddly, however, he did not feel sick. He was simply vomiting with great violence, sending rancid fluid rocketing into the toilet. He felt not unwell, but unreal, unmoored. His condition was closer to seasickness, or carsickness, or heartsickness, he realized. Mumbling something about not feeling well, he grabbed a pillow and went downstairs to the sofa. Soon he was fast asleep, the day, and surprisingly well. He got a lot done for a man who had experienced his life being torn apart. He drank extra water all day, did a solid jog, smiled whenever any of his three employees passed by and made it home early to cook dinner for the kids. They had a great time until Karen came home, at which point Richard found himself dashing toward the bathroom, water in his eyes and spit leaking from the sides of his mouth. He wretched like a man flinging himself to suicide, his body whipping forward and back, bringing points of light before his eyes and vertigo. This time, however, the guest room provided no refuge, so he bundled up some blankets and took the key to the boathouse, a simple cabin, it was designed for storing boats, and had double doors, its own air conditioner, and a refrigerator for the beer-soaked boat parties he had hoped once upon a time to have. He fell asleep on the old sofa he had inherited from his grandmother, wrapped double in blankets, shivering not with coal, but an icy terror that had come from within. The next morning, he waited until she went to work, then took the kids to school and pulled in at his office. He told Sue he would be working remotely, took a few files and his laptop, and turned to leave. You remember your rules about fair play, Mr. Thomas, said Sue, and how you should do what's right for people, even if they don't know it. She handed him her car keys. I heard some things, Mr. Thomas, she said. I hope they're not true, but if they are, you'll want to know every last horrible detail, won't you? It's what all of your friends said. Richard takes the pain. So take my car. The tank is full. 
and do what you need to. She won't recognize it. He stared down at the keys. Thank you, Sue, I owe you, he said, handing her his keys, unable to meet her eyes. The hell you do, she whispered after he was gone. In her tiny Honda, he drove to the tiny little mini mall, sandwiched it between a school and a church, where to real estate offices and an old colonial retrofitted with one-way mirrored glass house the ad agency. Parking at the church, he got out his binoculars and then on his legal pad, made note of the cars in the lot as well as their plates and descriptions. He lobbed the times they came man went. Luckily, the office had no enclosed parking, so when Yep came out, Richard was able to clearly see Karen get in the car. He got some pictures using Daniel's old camera. As soon as they left, he did nothing. The light cycle there had them trapped, so he waited a couple minutes before sliding out and almost catching up to them at the next light. Staying a dozen cars behind, he used the binoculars over one eye to know when they were signaling. He went a block ahead, turned down a side street, and spotted them at a distance, catching up. He knew this area of town well enough to guess where they were going. The old Bayou Ridge Hotel right on the edge of the woods. It's where I'd go if I wanted to conduct a sad affair, he thought. Finally, the little Honda slid into the parking lot and he got the pictures he needed. The two entering kissing in the car, entering the motel room, and leaving an hour later. He let them go, then lazily drove back to the office. They were just going inside. He saw Karen look up and around, as if she picked up a warning but then she went through the door. He thanked Sue again in his heart for having had the foresight to get him an anonymous car. After he sent the kids to bed, Richard began his nightly ritual in the boathouse. If he stayed to lawn in the main house, he started to get the first inklings of heaves, the spit flooding his mouth, his eyes watering. Once he got into the quiet of the boathouse, waves lapping against the little seawall 20 feet away, he was able to sleep well and hard on the giant solid sofa his grandmother had bought decades ago. He felt like she was still watching over him, fingers crossed that things would turn out all right for him. What did Karen think of all of this, one might wonder. Her husband vomited profusely in her presence, spent no time with her on weekends, and seemed to be ignoring her dalliances. They had not been having much sex before her affair began, but afterwards, it dropped to nothing, in part because her husband threw up violently whenever in her presence. It took Richard several months to process what had happened and start counteracting it. One of the links bookmarked on her computer, you can find the second Windows account because there's another folder for it in the user directory, which you can see if you boot a repair disk in admin mode. Describe how to basically shame man then cuck your man. You broke down his confidence, forced him to know about and accept your affair, then cut off all affection, but bossed him around on daily issue. He'll come around, it promised. The article left a bad taste in his mouth. Written by some purple-haired liberal with a masculine face and wild eyes with three sides of white showing behind her thick glasses, the article took a jubilant tone. Men, it said, had killed women for ages, enslaved them, and controlled them. It was time to strike back, by taking out the nice ones apparently, it reveled in manipulation and belittling. At this point Richard realized how truly dead and gone his marriage was, because no one who loved him would treat him that way. This was abuse, and his wife was an abuser. He remembered his high school counselor warning the boys against men who wanted to be their friend. Anyone who does something that is not in your interest, but serves their own, is not a friend. That is a predator, or a parasite, or at least someone who wants to use you, and that's not love. That is never love. Get away from this person as quickly as possible. The story that rarely gets told in questions of infidelity, whether sexual or merely rejection of the esteem of the spouse that forms the absolute emotional and moral bond which allows marriage to work, is that of the children. How does this affect them? Let us take a snapshot. Robert, Kaya, and Suzanne called up Daniel at college to tell him what had happened. Dad is living in the boathouse, said Robert annoy at how thin and cracking his voice sounded. Mom spends all her time at her job, including nights, especially nights, and she's gone on trips a lot. Daniel sigh, I was worried about this, he said. Mom has always had self-esteem issues because she rushed into marriage and missed out on what her friends did. Parting it up at college like in the sisterhood at the traveling pants and having lots of beaufriends, traveling to little villas in Italy like in under the Tuscan sun, having adventures like eat, pray, love, 
she sort of acts like she is living in The Handmaid's Tale or The Hunger Games. I think she is worried that the movie of her life just does not have enough of a spotlight on her. She's not really here for us, said Kalia. We have to find her to talk to her, and she's always gone. She's never home. All my other friends' mommies are there at night and on the weekends, chimed in Suzanne. She's just not here. It's like she's left us. Daniel thought for a moment. What does dad say? He keeps saying that he'll never leave us, said Robert. He's always around. When we're in bed, he goes to the boathouse and sleeps there. Trust my family to be totally weird, said Daniel with a laugh. Well, there you have it. They're having problems, but you've got dad. It's not really any different than what happened to Davis and Shelley when their mom left to go be with that personal trainer from her gym. Or when Christine's mom bailed to go live with her boss, or even Jake's house, where his dad got a new girlfriend so his mom has an apartment by the mall. So what should we do? said Kaya. Do. Daniel pondered. Welcome to adulthood, kid. Other people are going to flake out on you. Dad won't. He's too fair and generous. Mom might come back after she has her little adventure, but it's probably like when Roger's mom ran off with that traveling preacher man and then came back, it'll never be the same. Or when Kara's parents had an open relationship, and they're now like roommates, or, you know, how our next-door neighbor started dating her psychotherapist, and when she came back she and her husband were just sort of flat, not real lovey-dovey. Stick around dad and as soon as you can, get out, come to college or join the Air Force or something. What's an open relationship? Suzanne wanted to know. I'll tell you later, said Kaya quickly. Later? Like when you're 18, she thought. Thanks, Dan, said Robert. We'll take it from here. It sounded more adult than he felt. Back on the canal, Richard finally got the boat afloat. He had replaced the keel and numerous boards, but the old sailboat Shine Nan had a beautiful wood grain. He redesigned and rebuilt the cabin, replaced the erratic motor that he suspected was simply dead from metal fatigue, and motored down the canal so that he could take to the wind in the lake. He reflected on the old myth. The ship where in Thesus and the youth of Athens returned from Crete had 30 oars, and was preserved by the Athenians down even to the time of Demetrius Valerius. For they took away the old planks as they decayed, putting in new and stronger timber in their places, in so much that this ship became a standing example among the philosophers for the logical question of things that grow. One side holding that the ship remained the same, and the other contending that it was not the same. He had replaced a few planks in his life, too, but now it was more watertight than ever. He had no intention of drowning for the decisions of someone who clearly no longer cared about him, and had not for some time. Even though the old boat was only 16 feet long, he rediscovered the joy he had experienced sailing with his grandfather and later father, and found the old skills came back quickly as well. Karen walked in the door after another hard day, work. Despite what Yap had told her all those years ago, the workload did not seem to be declining nor did her firm seem to be rising above where it was. The press had favored them with lots of great articles about their benevolent work in the third world, but the money was not coming in as fast as she had anticipated. Her head was beginning to throb but she wanted a drink. Instead, she saw to her surprise, Richard sitting at the kitchen table. Richard, she said. How? Tills, he said. The doctor found something that interrupts the gag reflex. I went to doctors for years, looking for a cause to the vomiting, and they were all baffled. One finally asked if I threw up at night and I said no. He figured out that if it did not happen when I was sleeping, it was in my head and not my stomach. They did a brain scan, I mean MRI, which was terrifying but there are no tumors, it's just psychological and always was. I don't even have an ulcer, apparently a somewhat common stress reaction. This drug turns off the gag for a few hours so we can talk. So she said. What are we talking about today? Nothing big, Richard said quietly. The kids are gone, so it's time for us to think of the future. We're both getting seniority, so it's time to protect our assets. The papers before you are for the formation, the corporate trust in our names, which will handle our assets and shield us from legal liability. Especially since your firm plays close to the line of the law, and the rumors are getting thicker about that, let me tell you, we need insulation. Have your lawyer look at it and return the signed copy to me, if you will. 
She looked at the papers, scanning them with a practiced eye. This was indeed a legal trust, incorporated in their state, with their attorney as one of the principals. Thank you for asking about me. By the way, said Richard, I'm still living in the boathouse and having a grand time. You wouldn't recognize the place with all of the renovations I'd put in. It even has its own mailbox. He waited to see if she grasped the significance of that. I don't know if I need this, she said. Looking at the paperwork, we're doing fine as we are. I'm going to sign it, and if I do, I need to start taking my income out of the family finances and putting it into the trust. That leaves you with only your salary. Keep in mind that this incorporates our 401k plans into the trust, so it protects those as well. It will also pay out for the children in trust income, probably not enough to live on but enough to get a little boost in life after we pass on. Fine, I'll take it to my attorney, said Karen. Thank you, said Richard. With that, he was gone. He resumed his regular relaxed behavior at the office. Sue waited six months to make her move. Richard had just completed a final bill on a matter for one of their oldest clients, and when he turned around, she was there in the door with the early afternoon sunlight pulsing through the window behind her. She looked nervous, her fingers dancing a little on the outside of a folder. Sue, said Richard, what can I do for you? I'm glad you're back, she said. Neither of them needed to elaborate, for the past months, it had seemed as if they knew each other like old battle comrades. She could anticipate what he was thinking, and he knew her vocabulary, the words she liked to use, what their use imply, and how they rated her confidence in any given activity, and she seemed to do the same for him. If only he had met her first, he mused, but that was impossible, and he would never take back his children. No, it was just another dream, an impossible dream. Yeah, what's done is done he said, actually, I'm just over it. I was told by people on the internet that I would have rage, and I had sadness. I was told that I would drink a lot of bad whiskey, but I still think the stuff tastes like cough medicine. People said you never got over it, but if I had any revenge, that is it, I am over it. Anything I do now is for the kids. And what about for you, said Sue, raising an eyebrow. She was very glad her old boss was back. Vintage horror, he said then chuckled at her shock face. Movies, Sue, I like old horror films, 1960s to mid-90s, because everything went Blair Witch Project or a Night Shyamalan after that. Karen hated them and said they made her feel scared like when her father and mother fought when she was a kid, so I just gave up, set it aside, now I'm catching up. He told her about the boathouse, the large screen television with surround sound, and other details he was implementing as he formulated his life after Karen. But what did you come here to see me about? Sue Color, I've been prospecting some new business, she said. It's complicated though. A potential client was once in a merger with another firm, but now that the merger has partially dissolved, might be open to new business. However, their former business partner wanted that segment of their activity. So I'm wondering if it's fair game to toss out my name, even though technically, the two firms are still linked. Richard looked at her in typical male confusion, she thought. They took the world literally as if everything were a woolly mammoth that needed hunted or a saber-toothed tiger threatening the tribe in its cave. Only men would invent fire, she realized, but then they would burn everything in a primitive childlike glee, and then only talk about different uses for flame. If the client is amenable, he said slowly, and the merger is well and truly dead, I'd go for it, but when he looked up she was no longer there. After work, back at the boathouse, he filed down wood and pondered the conversation. What the heck was she? Slowly the penny dropped. He found a new sensation in his gut, one of mixed excitement and trepidation, surely she had not meant that. But if she did, he stood suddenly, then sat down and replayed everything in his mind. Thirty minutes later he had dinner on the table for his kids and grabbed his car keys. He turned to his children, Guilt on his face, go, said Robert. Whatever you're doing, you haven't looked alive like this for, I don't know, weeks, and then he burst into tears. Richard held him close and swore that he would keep his emotions under wrap for his children, the innocence at the altar of sacrifice brought about by an act of grave desecration to what he had thought was a good marriage. As night fell and the birds were replaced by the droning of insects and the lush soft sound of sprinklers kicking on, 
he rounded the corner of the sidewalk leading up to an apartment on the west side of town. The Sheffield Apartments occupied a large segment of one of the most dreary side streets he had encountered, but it was in a safe neighborhood and quiet. He checked the address on her phone and went to a unit on the west side of the large sprawling complex. She answered the door before he knocked. You got my message, she said. I'm dumb, he began in an apologetic voice, but you came anyway, she said. Why, hope, he croaked. When we first talked, it was clear to me that you were a who not a what. There was just a vitality there, an honesty, and a direction. One door closed, you opened another. You went in their balls out and told me the honest truth at a time when, as I look back on it, I was surrounded by lies, I was impressed, and I still am. Then today, I try to never fraternize with staff, doubly so because I'm married, but she's that's over in all but providing a stable vehicle for my children, who I love more than anything else, he finished in a whisper. Richard shook his head to clear it, I hoped, rather than believe, that you were asking me what I'd do in your situation. You passed a message, unless I misread it, that maybe I wouldn't be the bad guy in this equation. And I hoped, until I sort of knew it, that what you were saying, if it's what you were saying I mean, made perfect, immaculate, bloodless sense. She handed him some kind of soft drink, he took a swig. It was the Dr. Pepper clone from Costco that is better than the real thing. He took another, thank you, he said. What is done is done, and wherever I failed, I will never know, if I even did, sometimes things go bad. A storm blows in and the baby birds fall from the nest, and you find them the next morning, when it's too late. Hand of God, or an aimless materialistic universe? I don't know, and I don't think it's my purpose to know. But, holy crap I'm rambling, you've always been in my thoughts, just as one of the most real people I've met. What about Karen? She asked dot dot. What about Alex? He asked, Susai. And here you go, making me admit a lie from the start. Alex is not into women, if you take my drift. He's my ballet instructor, something I do as a hobby, because, well, I like it, I guess. I asked him to help put out the fire in the office, since I saw you looking at me that one time, and I knew, and I didn't want to be the other woman. And like that, hope is lost, I see, said Richard. I suppose I got it all wrong, no, she said. Things have changed. I won't treat your wife like an imbecile. She made a choice, and she knows the type of man that you are. She walked away, Richard. And to be honest, I could go slap the silly witch, but I believe in that old homily. Never interrupt your enemy when she is in the process of making a mistake. She took the soft drink and gulped down a large sip. So I didn't, Richard began, his brow furrowing. No, said Sue. I've known for a few months. I think you have to. He stepped forward, then slid his forehead against hers. Hope, he said, it'll kill you every time. Not this time, she said, taking his hands, not on my life. They talked about something, and he came to on the sofa, sitting next to her and holding her hand. It's unusual, but I'm a conventional girl, she said. The last thousand years, maybe longer, have been a mistake. There's nothing in the rule book for this. But if you don't mind taking it slowly, I, we, we could make it work. They had been holding hands the whole time. Hours later, he killed the engine and coasted the car to a stop, risking a street park instead of waking anyone. It had been the most magical night of his life. From the depths of darkness, to the height of the mountain, bathed in the sunlight of morning in spring, and not even a kiss. He had held her until it was clear that what had been done was done. And they were conspirators now in an errand of hope, a mission of belief, lost in a world of people drunk with power and obsessed with death. Could it work? He fell asleep turning that one over in his mind. She had set down the rules, never at the office, never in public, and never in front of his kids. They would be a secret, but she was, as she put it with a fierce look in her eyes that evoked her Norman and Scott's ancestors, all in. A moment later he said the same thing, speaking clearly so that no one, his beloved, the wizards of time, the gods of the glade and field, could mistake his meaning. Chos was forever, he realized, and any moment could do it all in, like the moments that killed his marriage. You could step away from the abyss at any time, but this abyss, he felt, was only dark on the outside, and inside full of light. They met in the evenings, after the kids were in bed, 
at his rapidly improving boathouse. He liked to cook for her, but sometimes they just sat and talked. He caught up on her background, the shy honey-haired girl who was good at writing but never quite fit in, and learned that she was a black belt in jujitsu. She brought out of him things Karen never thought to ask, like how he had served a summer on a volunteer firefighting course in the Piney Woods. Their private vocabulary developed, and so did the affection. One night, sitting on the couch with hands held, then both knew it was time. No words were exchanged, they got up and went to the bedroom. Eventually, he summoned the bravery to tell her of his feelings. It happened a weird way, but I love you, Sue Scott. She burst into tears and fled the boathouse. He was hot on her heels, but she held up a flat hand, which was her signal for needing time, and then drove off. Deflated, Richard went back into the boathouse. How could he have crushed her, with something that he believed was positive? At work she was absent, not distant or cold, just not really there. He divided himself between work and sneaking glances her way. The questions overwhelmed his mind, and he fought to keep control. Sometimes the good guys don't win, he recalled his father saying. When work was over, he stood up stiffly, and mechanically made his way to the parking garage. There he sat in his car for a few minutes, fighting to make sense of what was battling it out in his head, or maybe heart. He drove home to feed the kids, and put on a brave face of listening to tales of soccer and mathematics class, a boy who pulled a pigtail the rotter, and a diorama about the Battle of Hastings. When they were asleep, he made his customary creep to the boathouse. She stepped out from the shadow of the wall into the light. I can't do it, she said. It's like having a secret life that no one else can see. I can never be what I want to be, your wife and mother to your children. And so no one will see who I am inside and why this choice is important to me. He held her then, brought her into the warmth of his chest and arms, and rocked her gently as she cried. The next day, work was as much torture as it had been the previous day. When Sue returned from lunch, she found a potted plant on her desk, one purple flower peeking out from moth-eaten and sun-cooked leaves. Most women would have wondered if there had been some mistake and pitched the poor pathetic thing in the trash, but Sue knew the language of her new love, and instead disappeared to the corner store. As her open-mouthed co-workers watched, she repotted the plant, scattering soil across her desk, then snipped away the dead vegetation and watered what remained. She placed it in the light, cleaned up, and went back to her work. As Richard strolled into the parking lot that night, aimless but not unhurried, since his children waited at home, he sensed her presence rather than saw her. If you want out, I'll understand, he said, surprised at how much it sounded more like a growl than the tender tone he had planned. She slid out from behind a pillar. It doesn't work in my mind, she said, but it does in my heart. I love you, Richard Thomas, but I'm a torn up mess inside, again. He held her. To know words is to know when they will communicate nothing but a jumble. He was sorry. He understood. He was afraid for her. He was crushed. Instead he simply held her and felt her pulse through her skin. The next day he stopped by her desk an hour before lunch. Wordlessly she followed him, and they got into the car. He drove cautiously to a somewhat beat-up church on the far end of town. A kindly-looking man, salt and pepper hair over his cassock stepped out of the stained glass lace door. And so, this is her, he said, holding out his arms. She is everything I could have hoped. How are you, my dear? Richard took a seat in the sanctuary, staring at the area behind the altar where generations had worshipped. Father Mulla poured tea for her in his office, talking softly all the while. About Richard and a divorce long ago, a family so thoroughly destroyed that he had set aside to plots in the cemetery. And then, about the man that young man became, fighting every step, hiding all of it from everyone while taking the pain and drawing strength from it. I don't know what to do, said Sue. My heart leans one way, and every practical I know says that this is impossible. Father Mullen nodded slowly, if you were on a deserted island, thousands of miles from anyone you knew, with no hope of rescue, would you be with him? Of course, said Sue. Tell me then, he said. What do you think marriage really is? Sue hesitated. It's a bunch of things. It's a bond for life. It's a promise. I guess it's a legal contract, and also a contract with, oh, God. He chuckled. I don't know why he brought you here. I'm a terrible, heretical priest. 
I spend most of my time reading Buddhist theory and old Greek literature. I don't agree with them that we show our faith to God by doing pious and charitable works and that is how we earn our place in heaven. I think we do it by making hard decisions like this one and doing what turns out best for everyone in the material world. Since God put us here for a reason, and in my view, it is to develop souls through suffering, including choices like these. The priest blew on his tea and continued. They call my view by faith alone, meaning that faith is not in charity, but in making ourselves right. If your heart is pure and your mind clear, you will do the right thing here on earth, and that's also the right thing in heaven. We cannot show God our faith, but must live it. That is the difference between love and a marriage ceremony. Life is random and there is no plan. Stuff happens, and it's how we deal with it that tells what we are inside. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. In other words, it's great to have religion, but when it substitutes for practical, realistic thinking however, it's a mental illness, he said. We can guess at what heaven wants, but it's clear that the two of you are very much in love and should be together. This creates a conflict between ego, or your sense of self-worth measured by others, and it, or your inner desire not only to love this man, but to have him. But the ego is tied to boasting, and the it alone knows true faith. Father Mullah sipped tea and continued. That means that if in your heart you love this man forever, you are married in the eyes of God. I think you already are, by the way. And the rest of this species can shove its opinions where the sun don't shine. Besides, I have a few suggestions for how you can work around this situation. Later, after thanking Father Mullet, she joined Richard in the sanctuary. They drove back to the office together. Sue broke the silence. You're right, he helped me clarify things. It is my pain at not having the big white wedding, where my family finally sees me as something other than a screw-up, and all my friends who and I and I finally feel like I am someone that has made me fear. Time moved forward, the plant in her office grew was transplanted a few times and eventually became a small bush in the corner. Every night, Richard took care of his children, then went to the newly comfy boathouse and made slow tender love to Sue. He bought her a ring with emeralds and diamonds, acquired a new friend group which knew her as his wife, and had the business by a condo where she lived with their rapidly growing brood. That weekend, he and Robert went out in a tin skiff with their lines in the water a practice his son had called hunting fish early in life to no end of amusement for his dad and his fishing buddies. I don't ever want to get married, said Robert. Richard chose his words carefully, as he often did, knowing that children remembered every comment, offhand or studied, from their parents, often for the whole of their lives. When he was interacting with his children, Richard realized he was not Richard alone, but first a parent, a general or pope to his family, and he had to get it right every time. Marriage is the hardest thing I've ever done, said Richard. It is also one of the best things I have ever done, if not the best. I got you guys out of it, and you're not mini-me versions of me, in my mind, but your own people who carry on the best of what your mother and I had to offer. But mom's never home, said Robert. It's like you're not married at all. I love your mother and always will, said Richard. She made some choices which, well, it's hard to see how things are going to shake out in the long run, have made things difficult. I'll always love her and forgive her, but her choices have consequences. Robert watched the line in the water. Is that why you're living in the boathouse? And Mrs. Sue comes to visit at night? Can't fool them, ever, Richard thought. Yes, it is, he said. She's a good friend. Is she going to be our mom? Asked Robert. No, said Richard. It's a little unconventional. I think most lives are, being both normal and having to work around the difficulties that arise. She's my friend, and your mother is your mom, she always will be. We're going to be a family, but just like your mother has some needs and wants, so do I. Robert thought for a little while. Okay, he said finally, that makes sense. So now I have two moms, yeah, basically, said Richard, reeling in what turned out to be a soft drink and covered in weeds. At that, they left and turned the launch back down the canal toward their home. Robert headed off to see some friends, and Richard went back to his little cabin on the water with a ruined household behind it. So this is what you have been doing, Karen began as she approached the boathouse. Richard was sanding that silly sailboat, as he always seemed to be doing, 
although she had to admit that it was further along. It's nice of you to take interest in what I've been doing, said Richard, puffing on his pipe to keep it lit as he applied another coat of all to the wood drying in the sun. This boat was left to rot in a barn for too many years and may have always had some, how shall we say, internal flaws, but I threw out the pieces that were never meant to be and replaced them with new wood. I signed the document, she said, tossing it toward him. Rodolfo, my attorney, said it was pretty standard and a good way to protect our money, but thought the corporate responsibility section was odd. What? That we donate 10% of any profits to the Arboretum? Richard puzzled, but kept his eyes guarded. At moments like this, they regained some of the sparkle they had from before he discovered her infidelity. No, the bit about a morals clause and, even more, the need for contribution, Karen said. It seems like you are grabbing a hold of my salary and for 101k. The trust only works if we put all of our wealth into it, said Richard. I'm sending everything I earn there, as I've done with this marriage. That's why I signed it, said Karen, but I had Rodolfo at a clause specifying that any personal purchases of mine came out of my earnings before contribution. Richard thought, as long as the same applies to me, I'm okay with it, he said. That way we're equals, and all that. He had anticipated her demand. After all, could, she said, walking away. Just initial the changes, she congratulated herself on yet another successful business interaction, but in the back of her mind, the thought briefly flitted that Richard was, after all, a professional negotiator. Richard vomited a steady stream of green into the grass, then unsteadily got up to get the hose. Ten years slipped by when Suzanne left for college with the intention of studying compiler design and machine learning. Richard felt a great sense of pride. His four kids had all gone on to do interesting things. Robert had, surprisingly, joined the Marines and intended to get professional certifications in Vican IT so he could manage network SCADA systems for warehousing climate control. Kaya got a scholarship to a private college and Daniel had made it out and was running his own plumbing business for luxury homes and corporate rentals, making more money, and he knew what to do with. Suzanne was starting high school. One sunny afternoon, Karen sprinted down to the boathouse in rage, then stopped. What was the procedure? She knocked on the double doors. Finding them unlocked, she went inside, clutching a thin folder in her grasp. Dot dot. What in the name of God? She exhaled. Someone had replaced the rickety old boards with new ones, grooved to fit together, and then she trocked the whole place. It had a little bathroom, albeit with a composting toilet, and was wired for electricity. He had an office nook, a kitchenette, a secluded bed up in the former attic, and the comfiest man cave living room she had ever seen, with leather sofas at adjacent angles to the television. A full-size fridge, she checked, was full of meat, beer, and the occasional vegetable which probably suffered from self-esteem problems. Was he having parties in here? Sure looked like it. Karen for a moment felt a sense of being left behind. Irrelevance tinged her self-vision. She was no longer relevant to her husband. When she spotted women's clothing, bras, and panties in the chest of drawers next to the bed nook, she realized in an instant that she had been replaced. Even more, this little to car garage size space struck her as more comfortable and welcoming, and the house had been for years. He had even framed drawings that each child had done at school, and had pictures of himself and the kids on outings she did not recall being invited to dot dot, framed on the wall was a quotation. I advise you to be wary, though never fearful. Be most wary about drinking, about other men's women, and about a third thing, about men and their temptation to steal. Havamal 131. She heard the boat motor up to the dock and her husband get out, then walk down the boards of the dock, which sounded like they were new instead of the faded, rotted planks that had been there for years. Oh, hey, he said, coming in the door. So, ah, uh, you like the place. It's very nice, said Karen dreamily, then snapped back to focus. What the hell is this, she said, thrusting the folder in his face. Adoption papers for your secretary's kids, no. Sue is my vice president, not my secretary, said Richard slowly. He tried to make what he said next as gentle as possible. They're also my kids, but now they would be taking my name and becoming part of our family so they can have their share of the trust. You had kids with the silly witch, what the hell is? Karen stopped mid-sentence. 
Exactly, said Richard. You abandoned me, so life went on without you. Counseling, fumed Karen. I want, but she stopped again. He held out a card between his first two fingers. We have an appointment this Wednesday. Richard turned to the table, emptying his pockets on it, and stayed that way until he heard her pump stock away and then break into a run for the house. Out on the lake, night settled in slowly, as it always did, and fireflies came out to play in the tall grass, being far enough from the bustle of the roads to survive. Days later, Richard found himself driving to a large house in Midtown. It had once been a family home, but like so many things of an organic nature, had been replaced by commerce and the relentless march of progress, something Richard no longer trusted himself to defy. And now was an office where the counselor rented a space. I'm Dr. Raul Winslow, and we're here with Mr. Richard Thomas and his wife, Mrs. Karen Thomas. This is being recorded for the protection of my clients and, ow, uh, myself, now. A knock came at the door. Richard answered it. I'm Nick Randall, attorney for Mr. Thomas, said the tall man in the sleek well-contoured suit. I'm here at my client's request to protect his interests and to explain some of what is going on here. Karen looked between the other three in the room. She had picked Dr. Winslow, a Catholic traditionalist of feminist leanings, because of his record in protecting the women by upholding the obligations to men in a marriage to reconcile at any cost. Now the psychiatrist looked flustered. Karen is here, began Richard slowly then shifted course. My wife discovered that for the past decade, I have been living with another woman in our backyard and have fathered three children by her. Holy shit, said Dr. Winslow, then recovered his professional mean. And you didn't tell her this, she was busy and didn't notice, said Richard. His attorney Nick began handing out copies of photos taken outside motels, each marked with year, month, and day. There were quite a few of them. You knew, the whole time, said Karen incredulously. Richard shot her a pitying look. When you love someone, you know their moods. You even know when they fall out of love with you and keep you around just to fund the house and kids. Nick spoke quietly. After discovery of the affair, my client placed his and his wife's income and retirement portfolios in trust in order to protect them from events of this nature. You will note that on page 3 of the agreement, it specifies a morals clause, stating that any party to the agreement who engages in publicly disreputable activity forfeits their share and is due only a nominal payment of $25,000 per year. Dr. Winslow seemed puzzled, but if you knew of the affair, Nick said he knew that she had done it once, not that she would do it again. Once she repeated the process, my client recognized that his wife had forfeited her share, and even more, that she had broken the contract behind the trust since she continued to live in the house and spend income from his earnings on items for herself. He ended out a sheet of paper, which documented dozens of purchases. My client recognized that in effect, she intended the contract to remain in effect, absent the provision about marital fidelity. He took a deep breath. This gave my client legal right to seek similar, a uh, companionship for himself, and he began a relationship with Miss Sue Scott, with whom as mentioned he has three children, and is now seeking that Mrs. Thomas consent to their adoption, so that they may carry his name and be considered wedlock-born children, in the eyes of the state. His decision to create the trust turned out to be prescient, because we have credible information that Mrs. Thomas and Mr. Sheehan are using company funds to conduct their long-term affair. Dr. Winslow paled, since this was not going at all as he expected, and like most psychiatrists, he knew little more than his textbooks had taught him, even if he thought most of it was clever gibberish. After all, over a century worth of psychotherapy had produced more mental illness in a population at large, not less, but he would never tell that to his clients. Let's take a step back, he said in a voice normally reserved for kindergarten children and the very insane. Richard, you observed that your wife was cheating on you, and instead of attempting to resolve the issue, you retaliated. No, doctor, said Richard, I attempted multiple times to dissuade my wife from infidelity. I worked out, upgraded my wardrobe, attempted to take her out to fancy pants restaurants, tried to get her to talk to me, and engage in backrubs and other acts, but nothing worked, despite my reputedly legendary skills. Once it was clear that the affair was not one and done, but an ongoing replacement of me in the marital role, I considered that part of the contract nullified on my part and found my own replacement for the absent and an affectionate Mrs. Thomas, Nick spoke up again. At this time, 
My client documented the process of abandonment by Mrs. Thomas. He purchased replacements for his toiletries, clothes, and personal effects, then renovated the boathouse to make it a second domicile, at which point he only attended the main house to cook for, clean up after, read to, and interact with his children. Nick handed Winslow another sheet of paper. This is a copy of my client's application for a second street address for the boathouse, establishing that it was a second household. Mrs. Thomas apparently did not notice or care that he was no longer receiving any mail at the main house, nor that his possessions never changed location. I also have a photograph of his toiletries with various dates of expiration almost a decade ago. We're getting ahead of ourselves here, said Dr. Winslow. Karen, you'll want to have a lawyer look over that document. However, we are here for marriage counseling. Is there any way that the two of you could resolve things, such as a nice dinner together? Can't, said Richard. Dot, dot. Can't or won't, asked Dr. Winslow. Can't, I've got this weird stomach thing where whenever I'm around her, I vomit repeatedly and violently. It's exhausting and the drugs to suppress it make me feel vile for several days. Apparently, they're hard on the liver. What about outside? Continued Winslow, desperate at this point for a chance to escape and still bill for a full session. He, too, had a sailboat, and as the saying goes, boats are pits in the water into which you fling large amounts of money. How about a vacation, somewhere tropical? Richard considered this. If I scheduled a vacation, will you sign the adoption papers? He nodded to Nick, who as a consummate professional did not let his smile show from his soul to his face. Yes, said Karen. Then we're good, said Richard. True to her word, Karen signed and notarized the papers and the adoption process, encouraged by Sue Scott, who had early on understood the complexities of Richard and his situation, began its slow grind through the creaky gears of an expensive yet mysteriously underfunded bureaucracy. Richard left a plain ticket under her pillow. He had thought about clearing out all of the old expired toiletries and clothes, many of which hung loose on his frame but constricted his new larger biceps and calves, but shrug it off. Instead, he went to the dock and launched his boat into the canal. Karen picked up the ticket later and smiled. Maybe this would work out, after all. She could have her cake and eat it, too, when she got to the airport in the morning two days later. However, Richard was nowhere to be seen. Confused, she made her way through security with only a cursory body cavity search and took a seat at the gate. Hours passed, and when the plane began boarding, she became nervous. Rising, she turned. Yep, she said. Fancy meeting you here, Karen, he asked. She looked down and noticed he was holding an identical ticket. I found it on my desk, he said. I thought you wanted to finally take the vacation we always talked about. Karen smiled warmly. Let's go, she said. Screw Richard and his little games, she thought. She'd have Rodolfo tear him a new one when she got back. Holding hands, they boarded the plane. Dak at the canal, the fish were not biting, so Richard headed in and suited up. He called Nick. Throughout the day, calls went out to the client list that Karen had carelessly left on her laptop. Hi, this is Nick Randall of Malhern and Rankin. I'm calling about our forthcoming litigation against the advertising firm that employs Yep Sheehan. And I am interested if your firm had knowledge of the ongoing affair between Mr. Sheehan and his subordinate, Karen Thomas, in which we intend to explore allegations of improper use of client funds. Were you aware of the extramarital relationship between these two? And did you at any time notice accounting irregularities in their billing practice? He did not receive any calls back, but the message had been delivered. Later, at the close of the business day, Nick and Richard found themselves facing the board of Jeb's advertising firm. Nick began. It came to our attention that Mr. Sheehan has been conducting an affair with his subordinate, Karen Thomas, for over 10 years. We have found documentation on Mrs. Thomas's computer that suggests there may have been commingled funds, if not company funds used outright to finance this affair, including lavish weekend trips. We intend to sue for damages to Mr. Thomas's business caused by public awareness of this affair and the resultant loss of trust that caused potential clients to avoid the firm with witnesses to testify to this effect. Accordingly to multiple accounts, Mr. Sheehan and Mrs. Thomas conducted this affair openly in the office with what we can only presume is the approval of the firm and, by extension, the board, we're wondering if you have an opening offer of settlement. 
As he was saying this, a secretary came into the room and whispered in the ear of the chairman of the board. Richard could only surmise that this was another client cancellation, as everyone involved attempted to flee the legal storm of steel and feces, which was rapidly approaching them. The chairman turned white, then red, we'll contact you, he said. Richard and Nick allowed them to be ushered out the door. Message delivered, said Nick once they were out of earshot. Two weeks later, when Karen returned home, she was in a foul mood. On their second day in Tahiti, emails from their legal department arrived with reprimands for both she and Yap. No one lost their jobs, but it was also clear that their careers were going nowhere after this debacle. By vote of the board, Yap was no longer a principal in his own company. Yep had raged and ruined the rest of the vacation by calling lawyers and ranting on about how they couldn't do this to him. Then he called his wife to explain. And Karen hit the beach with a cocktail. Keep him coming, she said to the cabana boat. Please, she slipped him a 50. As soon as the plane landed, Yep was gone. Karen would never see him outside work again. The next morning found Nick and Richard, wearing matching suits, facing Yep and his attorney. We intend to sue for defamation over the allegations made regarding my client. The attorney began, excellent, said Nick. And furthermore, wait, what, asked the attorney. You're new to this, said Nick. I've been doing this for decades. You sue us, we get discovery. For starters, we want Mr. Sheehan's schedule, his expense reports from all business travel on the dates we indicate and access to interview all staff who may have heard Mrs. Thomas and Mr. Sheehan discuss this affair in the office. The attorney paled, will contact you. Karen, in the meantime, went looking for work, but found that every firm in the advertising field in North America had received an attorney inquiry letter asking for details of her affair with Mr. Sheehan and the possibility of commingled funds or company funds being used to finance the meetings between the lovers in Las Vegas, Paris, New York, and Atlantic City. Not surprisingly, no one wanted to hire her at any level above a janitorial position, and that would only come with the requirement of a rigorous ethics course, which she would have to finance yourself. Richard breezed through the house and handed her a check. It's your 25000 for yearly maintenance, he said. House is free and the kids are taken care of. You're welcome. Having recovered from the shock, Karen followed him down to the boathouse with her jaw set. I never thought you were this immature, she said. You burn me instead of trying to work this out like mature adults. I try, said Richard quietly, tying off the boat. You may recall I spent a lot of time trying. You were not willing to listen, and so what? You destroy my life. Richard tossed the rope aside. Let me tell you something, Karen. On our wedding day, I looked into your eyes and saw what I considered the path to happiness. Love, a family, support in the day job to pay for it all, a cabin by the lake, retirement and traveling the world, then spending our golden years in contentment and Joe, visiting grandkids and spoiling them rotten. This was what I wanted, he continued. These are all the things that you will never have, by your own hand. You treated me like the help or one of your office flunkies. You threw away our love and with it, our future. There are infinite ways to betray your spouse, but the worst is that you scorned me, you treated me like the enemy. All I did was tell the tale so that the world knew that I was not a cuckold, a man who would take this lying down. Their eyes met briefly. Karen saw at once that she had never really trusted him, since who could trust a reckless animal that no woman could control? Richard saw the years of weeping children, terrified at the disintegration of their family and the arrogance with which Karen had ruled as a tyrant given power by her career. The anger flickered briefly. Screw her, he thought. Screw Hitler and screw Stalin, too, and anyone who lied for power, including all American leaders since March 16, 1861. Richard sighed and lit his pipe. I am not a martyr, Karen, as a wise man once said. There was only one true Christian, and he died on the cross, I am perhaps a darty under his Bodhi tree or Odin hanging upside down with a missing eye. I am that which learns from its mistakes. Your actions took away what I wanted, so I sought it somewhere else, but I refuse to divorce you because our children, the products of our love, deserve an intact family and the knowledge that they were not a mistake. Although your actions signaled to them that I was a mistake and thus, by extension, so was their creation. As if on cue. A bright white sailboat many times the size of his little boat motored up to the dock, Sue waved, 
surrounded by her children. I forgot to tell you, Karen, but you never asked, we're retired. Sue runs her own management consulting firm Nan, I consult. Since you would not wait for me to travel the world, I'm going with her and the kids, and we're going to have a grand old time, paid for by the trust. But that's not revenge either, that's just me reclaiming my life from infidelity. You want to know what is better than revenge? Richard took a deep breath, I forgive you, he said. I have no resentment, hatred, or anger toward you, I simply do not care. I have forgiven you, given up on you, and disconnected. Despite all your attempts to become what you saw as relevant, you have become irrelevant, and your ethics violations are really your own problem. He stood up and walked toward the sunset framed against the water swelling with summer rain. Subscribe to the channel if you like the video so you don't miss out on the next one.